Hello, my name's Daru McAleese, storyteller, druid, artist, voice artist, and other things. And I'm here with Romance in the Gothic for my talk on nature initiation, body horror and body transformation in British myths. And I'll just say that all the artwork in here is mine, both the photography and the drawings, apart from this ink splash here. So yeah, I'm just going to start with a reading from the Cad Gado, which is also known as The Battle of the Trees, a 13th century poem by Taliesin, who will appear in the talk in a little while. I have been a multitude of shapes before I assumed the consistent form. I have been a sword, narrow, variegated. I have been a tear in tear in the air. I have been in the dullest of stars. I have been a word among letters. I have been a book in the origin. So yeah, I'm just going to explain a bit about the territory that we're examining, because it's very much, if we're talking about nature initiation, this is very much about territory not just some of these stories about people defending territory, but about the land and its effect on people, myths, stories and writing. I'm going to look at three British myths and their elements of body horror and transformation will be examined. We're kind of going to zoom in a bit and pause at some moments of the story. Now, I'm not going to go through every element of each story, but just like the core bits and pausing to look at what's happening that may be potentially horrific that usually just gets skipped over when people are just sort of narrating or reading or sharing these tales. And as I said, the sites and the places of nature, because this is about nature initiation as well, the story sites are very important in relation to the concept of the genius loci, the spirit of place, which is very much the idea out of which these stories arise. So the stories are Math, Son of Bethonway from the Welsh Mabinogion, the Haynes Taliesin, which also links to the Mabinogion and is also Welsh, but from a different region in Wales, and Thomas the Rhymer from Lowland Scotland. So my background is, I'll just say, is non-academic. I'm coming from this as a storyteller and an artist, but also primarily a practicing druid. So I will be sharing a little bit about the druidic, druidic context to give a bit of conceptual framework. Um, and yet, the, I've said we're just going to do parts of the tales because the original stories are really dense and long, even though there's probably a lot, I'll get to that in a bit, there's probably a lot, so much we have lost. But, so these stories, the parts we have, are a mix of surviving translations um, that include history, recorded history, myth, remnants of older tales, ballads. So there's, and some parts are both what I'd call liminal, both real and unreal, include real and unreal figures. So yeah. Now, yeah, and I will say that there's gonna be some content warnings as well, I've got the sources up, but I'll talk about these content warnings at the start of each story because they're going to have their own clearly defined sections after which you can ask some questions. So, yeah, and like also, yeah, as a storyteller, I know these stories initially from oral sources, from people that would have known a lot of the Scottish travellers. So people like Duncan Williamson, Stanley Robertson, who you can listen to in haunted voices, and these are people that would have known these stories from childhood as well. So, sources. Welsh and Scottish myths primarily, I've sourced them, the older versions from the Sacred Text Archive, which is a great resource that has a lot of original texts from the sort of 19th century and a little bit older, some much older. Um, from the Mabinogion, I've used translations of 12th and 13th 13th century text that appeared in Lady Charlotte Guest's 1877 books. So I've used that. 
but I've also used for the Mabinogion um, a more contemporary book from 1984, Tales from the Mabinogion, which is illustrated and by Gwyn Thomas and Kevin Crossley Holland with illustrations by Margaret Jones, and I really recommend that. It makes it very accessible. And for Taliesin, I've used, and for some of the sources of the old poems, which I will be reading too, um, I've used William F. Skeen's 1868 text, The Four Ancient Books of Wales, which include the Book of Taliesin, the Red Book of Hergest, the Black Book of Carmarthen, um, which come from the 12th and 15th century, though there is some evidence uh, that some of these might date back to the 6th century. So yeah, well, go on, behave cursor. Right. So yeah, and then I've also used for contemporary interpretations of Taliesin, John and Caitlin Matthews' book, The Last Celtic Shaman, and I don't have listed here, but I've also used Caitlin Matthews' book, um, on the spoils of a noon, which is called King Arthur's Raid, which I've got up there on the other world, um, which is a superb book that tra has translations of the pre the Anun. And Thomas the Rhymer, I've used the Ballads of Thomas the Rhymer, which has many versions from the Sacred Text Archive again. So there's that incorporates some versions of the Child Ballads from the 15th century. Walter Scott's versions in The Minstrel Sea of the Borders, number two, Jameson, J.H. Murray, uh, The Romance and Prophecies of Thomas of Arkeldoon from 1875, but also I've used some, um, I've used some older versions from Elizabeth Burton's book from 2012, The Life and Times of Thomas Arkeldoon, which is pretty superb. So yeah, right. So, what I'm going to talk about first is the Druidic context. And I'm not really going to talk about what Druids do. I can do that potentially in another talk. I'm cooking one up that I've still yet to propose, but I'm going to talk about the worlds. Now, there was a question posed this morning. Oh, why are you talking about three worlds when there's four there? And how do they relate to one another? Well, it's all a mystery because these are just fragments of information. But I'll go through them. The three worlds are Abred, Gwynvith, and Kaigan. And Noon, the first concept mentioned here, is seen as the container of all things rather than being a world as such. And Abred, Gwynvith, and Kaigan, they wouldn't exactly be like an outwards expanding target of circles with one nested in the other. They are kind of described by some old Irish writers as being nested, but they also interpenetrate one another and sort of are all present within each. So it's kind of a big melting pot, or like a noon, the smelting pot of existence. But Abred could be seen to be where we reside, which is the world of humans, animals, plants, there's suffering and ignorance, but there's good and evil. It's some, you know, it's described. And there's primordial origins here. Winvith could be seen to be other lives and moving into bliss and happiness, but there's potential to fall back into the first circle. But don't think of this like Dante's circles in hell. And there isn't really, there isn't any concept of hell within this because really it's just psychologically what one creates for themselves, or maybe the spells that you use as a druid to transfer you to the next incarnation, you know, a la what Merlin was doing with Arthur in, in Once and Future King and transposing him into different animals. And then you have Kaigant, which is just a white point of infinity, the one force of all, the ultimate space of all creation could be seen to be the source potential for cosmic origin, but as you'll see, we'll come to that. And sources for these, I've used um, descriptions, contemporary description from Penny Billington's great book, The Path of Druidry, and from the Sacred Text Archive, The Bardas of Yolmer Gunnog. And, you know, Yolmer is an interesting figure because he was like, he'd 
proposed himself as having researched all of this material. But then many people later on came to find out that actually he'd done what they say, made it all up. And actually, I really love that because many Druids now, contemporary Druids now, use his material. And actually, you know, everything we're doing is, in, you know, it doesn't have to have a traditional lineage. It's all made up, you know, because um, we're working in the moment with nature. So it's almost like any prayer will do. <laughs> um, but I kind of love that slight, you know, um, scammer channeler, um, poet, researcher, mystic type figure. I've got a real soft spot for them. So yeah, I'm gonna skip then to the next slide. And I'm just gonna chat a little bit about the concept of nature initiation. And, you know, the places for each of these stories that will go on to describe at the beginning of each tale is very important. And this is my own personal perspective. You know, I'm not going deeply into the concept of initiation, but there's a point that I'll reach where I think, you know, the stories are talking about various deities and places essentially being involved in creating um, experiences that are teaching tools for some of the more naive and younger characters involved. So yeah, we'll come to that. Um, but the concept of initiation often refers to the idea of new beginnings. And this can be ritualistic or non-ritualistic in nature. People may often go usually out into nature, maybe solo or supported by others. You, you know, you have in North America and South and Central America, many traditions of vision quest type experiences where people are seeking to relinquish aspects of their previous life. And this is both what I call a conscious and a mysterious process because you're often seeking to open up to, well, to let go of aspects of who you were and to open up to a mysterious new person, i.e. some kind of uncarved block. Just need a quick drink of water. So yeah. And there's a few sources there, but they're included in the bibliography at the end. So you've got work by Philip Cargon, who's the current ex guide of Obod, the Order of Bards, Ovates and Druids, of which I'm a part, and The Path of Druidry by Penny again. So, um, I'm going to pause there, going to stop the share just to see if you have any questions about Druidry. Great, so here we have our first story, The Tale of Blood Eye With which, as you'll find out, there's content warnings for misogyny, et cetera, is named after the, the man, that one of the men that kicks all this off. So, but yeah, um, content warnings, there's murder, there's misogyny, and there's a thing that will be repeated, and I've used the phrase that someone popped in the chat this morning, enforced magical impregnation. So that happens quite a bit, and in the next story. So I'll be focusing on Blood Eye With, and there's a concept of wielding of magic as a tool of control, and with that, exactly in concert with that, is manipulation of women and the forces of nature. There's the horror of transformations, and I think one of the main motivations behind a lot of these stories, this particular story, is about power over territory. So yeah, just getting the links up, there we go. Uh, great. So we're into the story of what I'm calling the creation of Ladiwith. Part of the fourth branch of the Mabinogion. And I should say for this story and all of the other stories, it, there may well be parts that make you go, well, why is that happening? You know, and many of these questions might well be answered by the fact that we're we've lost so much. Either these stories are fragmented and being pieced together, so there's often conceptual jumps and weird gaps, 
but also these would be part of bigger mythic cycles and there would be many stories focusing on each of the characters, I would imagine, just in my own head, that are entirely lost. So there's a lot missing. So talking about the genius loci for this story, the setting is around Gwyneth in Northwest Wales, but also around powers and mountains and the rolling lush hills of the country around Aberystwyth. And in that area, there's an island um, called Anglesey in the sort of far, far northwest, which was the last stand of the last actual druids in the area in Britain, the last known ones, uh, who were massacred by the Romans there in that spot. So yeah, it's a very significant place. Ah, wait a minute. Whoops. Right. Excuse me. Now, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, and just talking about the branches, you know, if you think of a tree, we only have about four branches left, so there would be many, many more branches. So again, a lot is gone. Now, I had said also that there's quite a bit of background in these stories that I can't include. I will summarise that in a minute. But this, the point we're jumping in concerns Hluhlal Giffis, who's Hlu of the Skillful Hand. And he's been placed under a spell, a tanga, by Arian Rod, who is perhaps a remnant of a goddess. I'll explain who she is in a minute that he may not ever have a human wife from all the women that are on this earth. Now, the background of this is that there's a king who's also a magician called Math, and there's Gwydion. And Gwydion conspires with his brother to possess the lap maiden of Math. This is toxic and horrible, of course, right? She has no agency in this. Gwydion wants her. And Gwydion causes entire wars to get her, and he does. I'm afraid there's a scene where him and his brother then go into hut with her after all the wars, and I'll just sort of draw a veil there. And as a result, they were punished by math for maybe more than one year, maybe a couple of years, every few months to turn into a different animal. And as a result of all of this, we've had the point where a new maiden was required for the king's feet. That is to rub his feet. That's what the Latin maiden was. Uh, now, what happens just before this quote here that I just read is that they're testing out different women. Gwydion has suggested Arian Rod. Now, there's a quote coming up with Arian Rod that suggests that she may well be an older goddess. Because her name Ariane and Rod translate into her name possibly being the Lady of the Silver Wheel that hints at her knowing so much about the whole wheel of existence. And there's something else she says. And what happens? Math's wand is placed near the ground, and each woman is asked to step over. Ariane Rod is not keen, but she does it. And Gwydion enchants the wand so that as soon as she steps over it, she gives birth to two children. Now imagine this, right? I skipped over this sadly this morning, but imagine this, right? You are stepping over a wand. You think, oh, this will just be like a test. You know, I don't have to give birth or anything. But this is the first enforced magical impregnation and actual physical birth at that point. I don't just think, pop it pops out like a cork but I think actually she I'm imagining because we need to pause this and think you know she actually physically gives birth <sighs> but Widian, not only doing that he then steals one of the children which is Clue and this is why Arian Rod says I curse you, you may not ever have a woman wife from all the women that are on this earth. So what Gwydion offers to do when Flu comes to him and Math for assistance is to Frankenstein's doctor-like, Frankenstein's monster-like, to make, to make a woman out of flowers 
and they choose Oak Broom and Meadow Sweet. And the name Bladiwas means face of flowers. So there's some quotes I'm going to read next. Uh, right, okay. And this is the first quote is what Arian Rod says to Gwydion, then Gwydion speaking to Arian Rod. An uproar thou hast caused in this country today. Now I will lay a destiny upon this youth, she said, that he shall never have a wife of the race that now inhabits this earth. Then Gwydion, verily said he, thou wast ever a malicious woman and no one ought to support thee, a wife he shall have notwithstanding. So two interesting things there, more misogyny from Gwydion, thou wast ever a malicious woman. <laughs> She's the one that's been abused with an enforced magical impregnation and pregnancy. But also there's a hint here that Arian Rod is of a more ancient race or deity, more ancient deity, because she says of humanity, of the race that now inhabits this earth. So she knows the vast cycles of time, the lady of the silver wheel. So then this is the description of the die with being created. Math, the son of Methonwe, complained most bitterly of Arian Rod. Gwydion showed him also how he had procured arms for the youth, because they also always sought to go to battle. Well, said Math to Hlu, we will seek, I and thou, by charms and delusion, to form a wife for him out of flowers. So they took the blossoms of the oak and the blossoms of the broom and the blossoms of the meadow sweet and produced from them a maiden the fairest and most graceful that a man ever saw. And they baptised her and gave her the name of Bladiwith. Now, it is very possible that that addition of and they baptised her could be a later addition, but it's hard to pick apart these things. So, we have there a great headline, which is a thing that's really going to happen. But I was murder lady, right? So I know the audience. So then we have Bladai with who's been created, just like Frankenstein's monster, monster, but out of flowers. And she was made to go and be the wife of Clue. But you know, she's got. Because she's a being, she's not just a creation or a robot or a monster, but she has her own agency. And when Flu would go away, she'd roam and she, would, she met and fell in love with another man, Gronwe, who's a lord of Penlin. Now, here we have the die with murder lady, because together, and there isn't any indication that she was the one that inspired it, but together they conspired to kill Hlu. And there we have a non-human murder lady made of flowers. Fabulous, I love it. But because Hlu was born of magic from a goddess, Arian Rod, and despite him being cursed, he was still protected and could not be killed in normal ways. And there's a particular way that Hlu can be killed, which is quite complicated. Now, in some, there were some questions this morning where people said, OK, well, it's not all bits of this make sense, and I don't think it's meant to. I think it's meant to be entertaining. But what I was says to Hlu, well, look, if you show me the special way you could be killed, you know, rather than keeping it secret, because we love each other, I can protect you. And I will know exactly how you can be killed and know exactly how to stop it. So she sets it up so that Clue acts out all of it for her, out in a stream in the woods. And the method of killing him is that he cannot be killed either at day 
or at night. Not indoors or outdoors. Not riding nor walking. Not clothed or naked. And not killed by any lawfully made weapon. Now, the way that he can be killed, the clue revealed, was that he could be killed at dusk because that is neither day nor night. Wrapped in a fishing net, because that's not quite clothed or naked, with one foot in a cauldron and another on top of a goat's back, because this is neither riding nor walking. And by a spear into him, which has been forged over a year when everyone is meant to be at mass. So that's technically not lawful. And under a bower, because that's neither indoors nor outdoors. And this, there's a few folk songs I might mention because I'm really a fan. If you check out the song Scarborough Fair, this is also containing impossible tasks because there's, that's a spell. These songs are a charm. It talks of a charm and a spell, just like this, because this is a spell that can be broken. In Scarborough Fair, it says, tell her to make me a cambric shirt with no seams nor needlework. Tell her to find me an acre of land between the salt water and the sea strands. Tell her to reap, reap it with a sickle of leather, and then she'll be a true love of mine. So they're all impossible tasks. And, you know, um, Ariane Rod is, I've said that she's the Lady of the Silver Wheel, and Robert Graves also hints in The White Goddess about her being quite powerful because um, Keridwen, who's going to come up next, has the end part of her name as Wen, which means white, which relates to the White Goddess, and Graves suggests that Ariane Rod and Keridwen might be counterparts of a multiple goddess. But yeah, just there's no evidence for that. That was interesting. So, what happens next is that the diver has got clue to demonstrate exactly how this. So, if you can imagine, he's standing there with one foot on a goat, one in a cauldron, under a bower, dressed only in a uh, fishing net at dusk. Looking pretty wacky, but hiding in a bush, Gromwell has this spear that they've made. And he strikes and throws it at Lou, who then, we have our second transformation, transforms into an eagle. And this isn't transforming into any old eagle, but transforming into a giant human-sized eagle, massive. And I'd imagine that this is, and he's not transforming into an eagle with the consciousness of Clu. He transforms into an eagle as an eagle. Because Gwydion has to enact a lot of magical spell song work to change him back to human, and then there's healing required. And just if we pause for a moment, you know, there's not only a murder happening there, and I just kind of can't help but think, you know what, good on you that I live. Like, I can understand your rage. But also the transformation of Clue into the eagle, imagine the pain of that and the psychological confusion of that. So there's horror in there. And this story, like I said before, with an earlier part of it, takes place over a long period of time. Because he's there, an eagle, dotting about doing eagle things. And Gwydi and Math have to summon their soldiers to find him. And this takes months. So he really embeds into being an eagle. And this is a much more painful version of the type of transformations that Arthur went into in uh, Once and Future King with the Ant Kingdom and the geese and other animals which I can't remember right now, so other people might remember in the chat, where, um, you know, this is, at least on some level, Arthur thought, well, okay, I'm being taught weird things will happen, but here, you know, it's just like 
boom, spear in the chest, I will. Very, I'm imagining very much um, an American werewolf from London, sort of like bone crunching transformation. And then the brain just like, the psychology just like shoom, altering, wild. So Gwydion and Math then over another period of months have to nurse flu back to health again with songs, singing in England um, or many, or even singing like Celtic, I should have mentioned this earlier, but singing like Celtic fawns, which are very akin, very much akin to the sort of uh, Sami chants where the songs that you're singing in a fawn, what you sing you become or you transmit. So Flew was nursed back to health and I would imagine psychological health. Then Flew takes charge with Gwydion and Math to muster the entire region of, region of Powers and Gwyneth to take the land back from Gormley, not only hunt down the Dywith, but to take the land back. So Gwydion then hunts down Blodiwith and transforms her into an owl using magic as punishment. I'll get on to that next. So yeah, oh yeah, got that bit. Right. So Gwydion says, I shall not kill you. I shall do something worse. I will let you go in the shape of a bird because of the shame you cause Lou. You will fear all the other birds and they will feel bound to attack you and molest you. And forever you will be called Bladiwith the Owl. So, Gwydion, who's previously stolen um, a king's lap maiden so he can possess her, and then forced a goddess to have two pregnancies and then stole her child and then not, and then created a woman out of flowers and given her no agency and forced her into marriage. Then says, the shame you cause Lou. And he not only wants to transform her into an owl, but he wants to punish her. And I said this morning that a lot of these animal transformations, there's one sense where people being transformed into some animals, such as pigs, because they live in dirt, as far as people of that period and Celtic period were concerned, is a punishment. There's also an element of teaching, but as I'll get to it at the end of this slide, there is a large element of possibly that Blodiveth has had her own agency all along and Gwydion is not doing anything to her. But he still seeks to molest her. That is horrific. So she then gets transformed into an owl. So there we have another transformation. So we have a non-human woman who was created a lady of flowers, all woven into flesh, who then now is turned into mammal, into an owl. And that's another horrific transformation. But there's another death. Gronway, who she loved, runs and escapes to his own lands. And again, they muster soldiers and Flew faces him and demands that Gronwy must receive a blow from his spear. Now, traditionally at that time, <clears throat> I mean, reputation was big and reputation could still be gained if you had the allegiance of your war band so that they could take the blow for you and other such things, but they refused. And Gronwy then said, okay, I'll take the blow on one condition that I can place a tall stone between us. And Flu throws the spear with such power that it goes straight through the stone, killing Gronway. And there is an ancient standing stone on that site, which may not be as old as that period, but is certainly old, called the Chlech Gronway, Gronway's stone. Now, within this story, 
it's clear that the male magicians were trying. They were trying to bind the forces of nature, but they could not hold it. Because I believe the whole time Blood Iris was free, and that in the end, I believe that she freed herself, that she transformed herself into an owl. A powerful animal, still one of the animals within, for example, if you look at the, the druidic pantheons of animals and their magical teachings, that the owl is a potent symbol of wisdom, of knowledge of the other world. So I think she was free. And I'm going to read because I'm I said that one of the next stories that we go to is the Taliesin story, but in all of these poems and epics and myths and tales, even now, even though we only have fragments, are really all quite interconnected because Taliesin has something to say about this. And as I said, a lot of these poems are a lot about bards boasting, saying they're better than other bards, like what's changed. But in the hostile confederacy, which also includes some of the origins of Taliesin as well, Taliesin is boasting about the origins of Lodiwith and how his words, which act as a spell, which cast a spell, have greater magic. And he says in the poem, I know all the craft of Gwydion, who made great mockery and nearly a disgrace. Now that could be read two ways. Great mockery and disgrace could be, ah, uh, what was Blodiwith who was created and the disgrace and shame she caused, but also it was a could be read as a disgrace of the way that Gwydion used magic and his spells. And there is more, there are more hints I'll talk about later that all these stories hide very small fragments of largely lost teaching tools, because all these poems and old epic myths for the old bard at schools would have been teaching tools. So, you know, there is teaching in there, um, but we'll get more, get onto that more later. So let's see. So I'm going to pause the share here and we'll stop for questions on that story. So now we are moving into the Haynes Taliesin. And content warnings, there's monstering of people with disabilities, there's ableism very much in the heart of the story. There is um, implied cannibalism, implied child killing. And I should say, I meant to note it down here, just like with Math Son of Mithonwe, there is another um, enforced magical impregnation, okay? And I will let you know when those topics come up. Taliesin was a sixth century poet, but it may have been a title. He may have been historical, he may not, but he may not have been, so we don't know. Gonna focus on Guion and Caradwin, two of the characters, and the themes of the monstrous feminine will arise. The horror and the transformations we're gonna look at, again, as a con should be a warning for concept of being swallowed and chained, changed, which does time with the cannibalism. But also there will be further information about the themes of how these stories may have been teaching tools. And also the idea behind the monstrous transformations being um, teaching in themselves. Right, so this story, the Haynes Taliesin, was included within Lady Charlotte's guest translation of the Mabinogion, but it's excluded from many of the current contemporary books. And it is again possible that this story, this individual story of Taliesin now, is just part of a larger story because also, there's also other stories of the daughters and the sons and stuff like that. So the whole lineage may have had all stories about it. And just like the Thomas the Rhymer story, the tale is from the first person as are many of Taliesin's poems. And the setting here is very specifically in and around North Wales, around Snowdonia. 
and I've been around here. I mean, I've been to some areas in the previous story, I should have said. Um, but I've also particularly been to Lake Balak, which is very much like the cauldron, which is another image, like the cauldron of a noon. And we'll get to a cauldron soon. And I've been up some of the mountains in Snowdonia, which are really craggy and fabulous. And, you know, there are stories just like uh, Shangri-La of some people still say now, some druids I know say that if you go down certain lost valleys, you may well find the crystal mountains of the lost druids. Now, this story centers first on Keridwen, who's married to an awful husband, Tegid, who gets ditched very quickly. Quite a lot of characters get ditched in this story. But she was a witch druid, that's what I'm calling her. And in many versions, her abilities were diminished, particularly in contemporary versions, where her skills were dependent on her riding a horse off to find the druids in the Crystal Mountains and gaining information from their books. But in the older version, she had her own abilities and created and conducted her own magics. Now she has two children, one is dark and one is light. And there's also a hint that occurred when is a goddess because when, white, all that relating to the white goddess potentially. Now, her light child was her daughter, Creoli, who was said to just be a glowing thing of beauty. And she's ditched very quickly in here, but she does appear in a second version of the story that I'll talk about in a minute, or a second story. But it's her dark son this story focuses on, because his name is Morfran, known as the Great Sea Crow, is what it means, the Cormoran, which I think are ultra cool birds, just like somebody said in the chat this morning, I totally agree. But it was, he's very other than this story. So this is where the content warning comes in for disability, because in a very ableist way, he's implied as being ugly and she, Kerdwin, seeks to heal him, to give him inspiration and magic and status. So there's a real, he is really described as being ugly and he's given the nickname by the family. They give him a nickname. A vag theme, which means beautifully utter darkness. Now, how lovely is that? And it's implied that because of all of this, because of his nature, that he wouldn't be able to have a place in society then. So, a lot of what she was doing, and we covered this already in the previous tale, mentioned it that status and reputation were very important. So, she sought to give him that, to not only give him magic and knowledge and inspiration, but poetry and wisdom, and through that, he could have a place. But things went wrong. And we'll get to that, because there's a character, Gwion, who appears, who very much like Finn McCool in the Irish tales, who accidentally eats of the three drops of fat from the king's salmon and becomes an all-powerful warrior. The character, Gwion, takes the three drops instead of a Vagathy, and a Vagathy gets ditched from the story. But hinting at the teaching tools, I'll get to it more, but I just want to headline it and saying, in a lot of ways, Keridwin is the presiding force over the inner and outer death of Gwion and his rebirth, which is essentially a lot, touching a lot on Druidic teaching. I'm doing that because there's a wheel that will appear soon. <laughs> now, it should be said that what Keridwen sought to do in a giant cauldron by the cauldron of Lake Bala, she sought to brew together a mixture, an elixir of inspiration from material she collected from nature over a whole year and a day, because the extra day is when the magic happened. It would be stirred and cooked for a whole year and one day. And this elixir has only three drops, which are called Awen, the drops of Awen, which is described as being bright knowledge. 
or as Yeats in his poem calls it, the fire in the head, inspiration. But the rest of the mixture is what's called baleful knowledge, but we'll get to that in a moment. Now the poisoned land, that gives reference to the baleful knowledge and ecological disaster that we're gonna to get to. But Mordra, an old man, the sea father, and Gwion, whose name means little seed, or the innocent, a young man, were journeying through the land. Now, one of the hints, one of the things that we discussed this morning in the meaning of all the animal transformations that are going to come up in this story, we discussed the idea that a lot of these transformations are a movement through the wheel of the year, through seasons, through the ages of a person, but also through the elements and through animals linked to each of those. So the whole chase is a teaching map, a map for teaching, but most of it, again, is lost. But this does tie in with the history of the Bard at Schools, which existed in <clears throat> Wales and Ireland and may have in other places, but there's not much evidence for that. But there are hints that Mordor was teaching Gwion because younger people would be taken from the places where they lived, not against their will, but by choice, and taken to the Bardot schools where 20 years would be spent on their first probationary levels of learning the initial epic poems, which contained a lot of these teachings possibly. And I think there's a suggestion that all of these, are, all of these stories are seen to contain transformations, particularly this one, because people, when they return to their village, are seen to be transformed and different changed by these teachings, just as um, fairies kidnap children and turn them into changelings. So there's some kind of crossover there. So they're hired, Mordra and Guion, to tend to the cauldron for a year and one day, but with a warning from Caridwen that she will hunt down any of them if they take of the three drops, except her son, because this is for her son, this is her gift. So they tend it, they feed the fire, and during that time, during that time, Mordra is teaching Gwion. So we fast forward to the last moment of the last day. Mordra asks Gwion to place more wood in the fire. And at this point, we have our ecological disaster and we have horror and we have cosmic change on many levels because the cauldron is said to have shrieked as if in pain. So there's one horror, an inanimate, giant, forged object screaming in pain and three drops flying across the room. But at that same point, we on, his fingers get burned by it and he sucks on them and, and inhales and takes in the three drops. But also right at that moment, with the cauldron shrieking, Gwion going, what the hell? All the baleful noise, the rest of everything but those three drops is a black, poisonous liquor, baleful noise that spills out. So they're screaming, black spilling, cosmic change going on. And the story skims past this point, but this entire area was described as being poisoned for more than a year. I don't think it heals in a year. I think it may be a number of years. The land, the waters, the fish, the plants, all the horses are killed. Very much horror and ecological disaster. And I didn't mention it this morning, but the land and the water turned black. All of the life died for miles. And the area around the stream and the waters were named, renamed the poison of the horses of Gwyndal. That puts a chill through me. And just as that happened, Gwion ran away because he knew he would be chased, because he'd been warned. Caridwin then has already arrived and knows what's happening. She 
takes up a log and smacks Mordra, the old man across the face, knocking out one of his eyes that dangles there. And at the same moment as a shrieking cauldron, black liquor, Grion running away, old man hit across the head with dangling eye. We also have the young boy who gets forgotten just at this moment. Mordra, I mean, Morfran, Avagthi. He never appears again, but it's implied that he was sitting there. As everybody ran away, Rion ran and Caradwin chasing after him. And then just the old man tending to his eye with a broken, twisted cauldron, poisoned land, and Avagthi sitting there. And the only gift he has received is baleful knowledge. But there is a second story, which I've never been able to find. I've only had friends tell me about it. Uh, Philip Shalcrass of the British Druid Order told me about this. I have to find the source. And he says that there's another story where Kerdwin attempts to brew a second potion to give Morfran wisdom with her daughter helping brew it. Because she's older now. But Avagthi doesn't receive it. He then has gift the gift. He's received the gift of baleful knowledge. And it was said that he turns almost like into a wild stag and is appearing on battlefields. Wilt is the word, W-Y-L-L-T, a wild mode, for he would not be able to be touched by the swords of others and was the only last standing person, all covered in blood, of Arthur's last battlefield. And he was there standing untouched, spouting prophecy. And he was described as one of the three slaughtered blocks of ancient Britain. So yeah, that's a very different gift. So now we go into the transformations. So because Guion, he had prescience and his whole journey is governed by fear. He runs from the goddess and the mother who's screaming. But imagine him running through the wheel of age, of seasons, of animals, of the four directions, of time. He's like the moon, dark. Subconscious fears. She's like the sun, raging fire, and they chase each other around the world. And this journey takes perhaps a year. So he feels fear. <clears throat> and with the three drops, he has magic in him and he's able to change. And first he changes into a hare. And imagine the fear of that, your body changing, but he's just governed. And Curridan easily, quickly transforms herself into a greyhound bitch and chases him across the field as he darts away. And it's easy for her because she just goes flip, just like Blood Irith. But then we have second change, because he jumps through a hedge. And again, imagine this, not exactly as a magical battle, but this is all about magical inner teaching, the reason for which we've lost. And in his terror, he throws off his fur and plunges into a stream and is immediately a giant salmon pushing upstream, panic. Just pure panic, that's all there is, animal panic. And Caradwin, hungry, she said to in the previous transformation, be screaming with rage, and then there's the, her dog's sharp teeth, and he can feel her breath. And at this point, he can feel, he feels forced by the sharp claws and the teeth of the otter that she changes into. And he, terrified, jumps out of the water, and the scales tinkle off of him, and he changes into a tiny bird up in the sky. And at this point, shadow covers him, because he thought himself safe there in the great, vast blue. And she changes into a massive hawk. And as we go through all of this, just then imagine as Blodiwith had her two changes, with each of these, how would it feel? He's, he's going, he's about to go into his fourth change. 
it's easy for Carolyn. She's a goddess. She can go flick, 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 flick the witch druid from one to another. But Guion had no clue this was going to happen. He didn't know the effects of the three drops or even that he'd really properly swallowed them. So yeah, a lot of psychological terror going on there. So then the final change. Forced by what's called the sharp talons and the beak of the hawk. If you imagine, then he now spies below him a threshing floor and he turns into just one grain, a single grain. So at this point, I think Guion doesn't exist anymore. Guion's gone with each of these transformations, it's just been fear, terror, panic, running. But now going, I'm just going to disappear. And he falls. No mind as in the no mind of the Buddhists, complete renunciation, surrendering of the self. There you go, just like that's pure nature initiation, sitting out in the dark with the howling animals and just going, okay, I felt all my fears, I'll let go. Well, I'm saying that because I've done that <laughs> out in the woods. But you can also look at the song John Barleycorn, which is another great folk song, which then talks about, has got the threshing idea and the transformation in that. And... You know, a lot of these stories, again, skip over these moments and just say, oh, he transforms. He's scared. But imagine the horror. He's lost his mind entirely and let go. And she transforms instantly into the perfect thing down there to eat him. She struts and changes into a large clucking black hen. And she doesn't have to find his grain. She just goes pluck and finds his exact grain and swallows them right down so there we go here we have i mean we've already had implied cannibalism because she's sought to eat him at each stage and there was a great comment this morning mm, each animal transformation is turning into something sort of quite yummy and edible i thought that was brilliant but at this point but there is implied cannibalism and at this point guion is a grain you know, and she's sought to swallow him and he is now being swallowed by her. So she is seeking to eat him completely. But again, this could be implying a teaching happening that is then nature initiation, nature initiation wrapped up in the place and wrapped up in the um, animals transformation, which does then tie in with moving around the wheel of Gwynvid. I mean, Abred, sorry, Abred, which could lead to Gwynvid, which is the bliss and happiness, but you've got to go through the wheel. Which is the thing that perhaps Arianrod has had also knowledge of, which is why it's multiple, ter multiplied terribleness of then sort of taking her agency from her in that first story. But then, yeah, now Guion is swallowed. So what would it be to be eaten up, to be swallowed? How would that feel? It says here, Guion is not gone, but actually he is, he's gone. He's gone entirely, I believe. But he doesn't get digested, that was her intention, to swallow him up and just digest them and cast them out. And that's a horrific thing to imagine, to go through, to be eaten, swallowed, to go through somebody's whole tract. Yeah. But something different happens because he changes into a child with him. Well, then again, we have an enforced magical impregnation, except this hasn't been, this has sort of been carried out, it's a complex thing to unpick here because it's kind of been carried out by the magic, not by Gwion. Gwion hasn't gone, right, I'm going to do that to her. He wanted to escape. And she's gone, well, I don't want that. Because then, But she swallowed the seed. So it's kind of like very complicated. The magic seems to have its own power. But still during this process, it is said that she, when he is birthed, that she for a while wants to kill him, but she chooses not to. Now, someone asked this morning, well, why? Good question. But she cannot, 
because she decides not to. And I think the main implication is that it's nature initiation again, that on some level, that yes, the goddess has been initiated by the magic. She's then been taken on a chase she didn't intend. And it's had a child she didn't intend, but it's a child of magic who is no longer a human. She's birth, birthing magic. So there is a material aspect to magic because a nature initiation doesn't mean that you just sit out in nature and then you have a lovely sort of mental, emotional experience that doesn't really affect you. But you feel it physically. You go through deprivation. You either don't eat for a night or two. You get cold because you're sitting out with no shelter. There's material change. So she then also realises, I think, that she doesn't want to kill him because he is not Gwion anymore. I think that's the main reason, because he is fully or mostly initiated into his second birth, but not as Gwion. Gwion is gone. So that is not a thing to kill, because then this child is magic or magic embodied in a material sense. So she casts him in a leather bag into the waters. And there he has his third birth, which is kind of a mirror of the story of Merlin Wild, Merlin Caledonius, which is a, a little mirror also of, of Agathy, where up here, a few miles away from me, Merlin was said to have a triple death where he was strangled, had a blow to the head and drowned. So yeah, this is another stage in the teaching of Kerrigan presiding over Gwion's death and rebirth. In a way, she's, well, she's not just a psychopomp, but she's partly that magically. Yeah, she's a guide, but also being changed herself by the experience. So he drifts up the waters, and it's said that whilst in the bag, he receives stories from the waters, poems from the stars, songs from the trees, and tales from the fish and the air, and he matures. And he's there in the bag, which is another womb. And there is a very big, complicated denouement to the story, which I really do not have time to go into. Many of these stories have that where then he's found by Elfin, who is a future king, who's been punished by his father to wait on a salmon weir to bring fish back to him, but no fish are coming, but this bag comes, he thinks it's treasure, and he plunges his knife into it, just missing who previously was Gwion. And this being, this radiant child, so yeah, with the fire in the head, bright, golden hair, open eyes, but not of a child, but like adult's eyes with an adult's voice, jumping out and apparently spouting prophecy and poetry. And Elfin at that point names him Taliesin, which means literally radiant brow, which means having inspiration, poetic inspiration and wisdom. But as I said, there's further tales that continue there where Taliesin matures and he then takes a well-worn path of a lot of these, some of these bardic stories and poems where he insults many bards and gains power as a sort of renowned magician and poet and bard and so on, but blah, blah, blah. I don't have time for that. So yeah, just in summary then, yeah, this story contains many elements within the chase of lost rabbit teachings, potential of the theme of the year, like of Abred, if we imagine that they've not been chasing just for a few minutes or a half hour, but maybe over a year through each of the seasons, you've got north, south, east, west, earth, air, fire, water, the ages of humanity and stories of animals and poetry that a lot of these would, would have been taught to the students in the Bardic schools and maybe taught through these, through this manner. So, yeah. That's 
that story done, I shall then pause the share here and we can stop for questions. So now we move on to our third story of Thomas the Rhymer. And I know this area even more well than Snowdonia because I live around the area where this happens. And it covers a figure, a layered from the 13th century, Thomas of Erkeldun, true Thomas or Thomas the Rhymer. He's got like many names. And there's no forced magical impregnation in this story. Um, there's a little content warning of blood and killing of deer in a fairy party at some point. So that's lovely. Um, apart from that, there's not many content warnings, I think. But the focus will be on Thomas's journey. And this is more covering psychological or cosmic horror, the touching of the unknowable vastness of nature, which is kind of like that final world in the druid worlds of Kai Gant, just that white point of existence that obliterates the mind or the self. And there's the horror of being taken out of the human world and altered, which I think in itself is a metaphor for nature initiation. So as I said, the setting is around the Scottish borders where I live, and primarily the setting is around in two places. There's Thomas comes from Erlston, Erkeldun, where you can find the remnants of his tower behind an old shell garage and Eildon Hills, which are a triple set of hills near Melrose with old hill forts. And the soil under the sod is bright red, like the blood that appears later in this story. And Thomas was renowned for years after his death. He did exist. This was written down by him, it is believed. And he lived around the mid 13th century. So it survived into the child ballads and there's a romance and the prophecies and some prophecies by people like Walter Scott. Some of them were added and fabricated because some writers sought to incorporate his work to boost themselves up. Again, there's a lot of male bardic boosting. So this story largely takes place around the journey into the other world. So touching on the themes of death and rebirth and mirroring like the journey that Reverend Kirk of Aberfoyle took when he was abducted by fairies on the, from the Clutie tree in Aberfoyle, where he then wrote, came back and wrote the fabulous book, Secret Commonwealth of Elves, Fawns and Fairies. Super book, I recommend it. Or also, like, if you go to Glastonbury, people still say nowadays, I've got a pal that says it constantly, that Glastonbury Tor has a doorway, a secret tunnel <coughs> into the other world. And that if you go there, you may or may not come out because you'll either go mad, become a poet, or die and never leave. So, hey, it's a lottery. And there is a tree, a rowan tree, marking the spot where his abduction happened. And it's said that, again, this opens, um, the, these ballads open in the first person around the time of Beltane, which is often recognised as being a liminal period. And Beltane on the wheel connects with it. And Beltane's also seen as being quite liminal because it's a time to really connect with elf and land and fairy. And he was either walking by the Huntley Burn or sitting under the Eildon tree playing his harp. He's described as maybe being a bit of a seducer, serial seducer. And the Queen of Elfinland appears on a white mare with 50 bells and three greyhounds and seven hunting dogs, baying as she rides up to him. And her greyhounds are very significant, actually all of her dogs are, because they're white with red eyes and red ears, which indicate emissaries or psychopomps of the other world. <coughs> now, there is one text, because there's many versions of this, that says, and this is where the seducer part comes, 
that seven times by her he lay. And she said, I pray thee, Thomas, let me be. And some versions have him kiss her. There is going to be a kiss in a bit that she kisses him, then he is in her power. But I quite like this version, one of the older versions, for she then, after saying, let me be, she turns her body and reveals, she changes her whole self with one leg turning black and the other gray. And it, this is a real cosmic horror sight because it's described as a doleful sight. And I say up there in the heading that she's the lady of an uncle land. Now, uncle means odd, strange, i.e., or great. Maybe relating to uncouth, I don't know, but uncle, but it maced uncle. So it's great, strange, and odd. And I guess that's where I come from. And fearfully, he kneels. And she says, I'm not the Queen of Heaven. I am not Mary. I am not from hell. And you must come with me to see the manner of my life and middle earth thou shalt not see. Then she kisses him and he is in her power. And she says, through Thomas, you man go with me. You man serve me seven years through weal or woe as chance to be. And now he, in his mind, he is dragged to hell. But he'll take a journey to the other world across liminal landscapes where the beautiful borders countryside turns into a wasted landscape, a desert, where the living land was left behind. And he's there, now picture this, he's possessed by her on the back of her horse, a maced uncle lady, a monstrous woman in his eyes he thought beautiful but is now doleful with baying hounds with red eyes and red ears and they plunge through a wasteland deep into the earth until blood rises actual blood rises and I'll tell you in a moment where this blood comes from it rises right up to their knees pure cosmic horror imagine this he's had no rest no sleep because it's said they ride for 40 days and nights he must have been beyond terror. But again, these, this could be seen to be the forces of nature initiating him. There is, I like, I've got my own personal theory that he had some experience on the land and the whole ballad that he wrote is the best way he can describe something extremely mystical and personifying with all these deities. Now, Yeah, he's well freaked out. Now they ride through that tunnel and there's an orchard that she shows him. In one story, he takes some fruit. There's a quote that I'll read soon that describes how that sustains him. And in other versions, the fruit gives him the gift of prophecy or truth. And in some other versions, she says, no, you can't even touch this. And here, yeah, like imagine she refuses. But he's invited to lay his head on her lap and she presents four paths to him. But bizarrely, because the number is always weird, it turns out to be five. So some readings from it from Burton, different versions in Burton's book. It was murk, murk night. There was no stern light. They waded through red blood to the knee for all the blood that shed on earth rins through the spring of that country. This was all the blood of all the wars on earth, maybe past, present, future, rushing through the tunnels into the other world or the underworld. And the fruit, she says, that fruit man no be touched by thee for all the plagues of hell alight on that fruit. But then in another, she says of the fruit, Take this for thy wages, true Thomas. I will give thee the tongue that can ne'er lie. I'll give you the tongue, tongue that can never lie, i.e. the tongue of true Thomas. And a lot of the imagery could 
stem from a lot of the superstition of that period as well. So you've got her saying, I'm not from hell, but then there's hell and that's root. So, you know, there's a lot of that you know, mixed in. Now, we're under the hollow hills, which is one of the names is used for the other world, the fairy world. And four roads are shown to it. One road, she said, leads to paradise. And if you read the poems, there's descriptions. One road to well away, which is an old name for hell, and two roads for the sinners. I don't know why they're separated from hell, but that's the way it works. But a fifth way appears. The queen reveals her path that she says she wants to take him on, which is the path leading to her castle on a hilltop. But I actually think reams of orchards and then a great fairy mount on a great fairy hill which is her court, and she takes him there. And she says that he must not speak or eat here, or he will never be able to return home again. And in the text, I'll read some bits soon, that there's hints of a dark king, perhaps a counterpart for her. So you, again, you've got the dark and light, like the forces of good and evil within a bread, or the dark and light child, within Taliesin, or counterparts on the wheel to teach someone how to integrate opposites. But this is, this, yeah, there's a dark lord that the queen keeps a secret from Thomas, and she is described as being lonely. Now, Thomas thinks he spends seven days there, but he actually spends years in her court at a party which has massive hints of darkness the dogs lapping at the blood of deer that gets chopped like wood by the fairy chefs. From Burton again. For guinea word, you should chance to speak. You'll never get back, get back to your own country. And she says of the road, that liggeth o'er yon foul fell is the way a well away unto the burning fires of hell and of the party, which also Thomas, because he's a harpist, he was asked to play his harp there and not speak. There was a revel going rife. Fifty harps were brought in. Ratchets lay lapping up their blood. Cooks standing with dressing knife, breaking up the deer wood. So it's not necessarily there's many rules here there's a dark lord the rules mean that if he breaks them he's kept there against his will there's dogs lapping up blood animals being chopped up you know there's real it's not just like hey lovely tinkly fairy party it's quite dark and he's already had he's ridden through all the blood of all of the wars of the world he touched cosmic horror. He's went under the earth and through the earth and into another world. His mind is either blown or gone. So I'm surprised he could still play the harp. But maybe that's the point where all this journey is taking him really into the good heart there. So. <clears throat> now. Thomas was then told after the seven days that he must leave. He wanted to stay. But the Queen fears, I'll read a bit about it soon. The Queen fears of that dark force as being a thing that will take him and sacrifice him. He is sped away on his mare out of Elfenland and directly back to the Eildon tree where he was playing. And he's given, in different versions, he's given many gifts. In one, he's just given a choice, music or poetry, harp or carp, and he chooses poetry prophetic poetry. But in many, he's also given the gift of prophecy, of truth, that's what we call true Thomas, and also the gift of entrancing folk through his poetry and music, like a fairy gift. When he returns home, there's more horror for him. Because imagine this then, and this could be akin to 
how people were transformed by the Bardic schools, just like the change ones, just like we on. And even all the characters in the Brodiva story, that the sort of magic and acting in a person is either sort of nature doing that or sort of like the sort of the sort of spells of words and knowledge. But many, he finds his tower ruined and many think him dead. And they're shocked to see him. He's shocked to see them and he's shocked to find out when it is. And never again does he feel, like Lou, that he has both feet in this world because he's got one foot in elfin land and one foot in the human world, but feels in his heart that he's a none, that he's a neither if he can't be with her. Because he yearned after her yearned deeply and it's said i think yes in the version by scott walter scott that he added an ending where thomas playing in his tower received a message this was many years later because he's traveled scotland already by this point sharing his prophecies <coughs> that a great White stag was walking down the street of Erkeldun, down the dirt track, and he recognised this as a message. He went to meet the stag, and with it, he walked back into the remnants of the forest of Caledonia, the great ancient wood of Caledon, where Merlin ran wild, and at that point forever left the human world to return to the queen and her land. And some of his prophecies include prophesizing the death of Alexander III, there being three bridges built over the River Tweed, and also many that were attributed to him that he never wrote, that other people fabricated. And I've got a little bit more reading to share. Yeah, there's one mention here of shoes of velvet green. And if you read some of the transcripts of the Scottish witch trials, you'll find that there's descriptions like of many figures, many visions of men from Elfin land who appear to enchant villagers whilst wearing velvet green clothing. So that's a really consistent piece of imagery. Now of the sacrifice that the queen feared, it said, to mourn of hell a foul fiend among these folks shall choose his fee. I trow full well he will attack thee. And of Thomas, he's gotten a coat with the even cloth. Until seven years were gain and passed through Thomas on earth was ne'er seen again. And Scott added this part, a heart and hind pace side by side, as white as snow on Fernie Lee. My sand is run, my thread is spun, this sign regardeth me. And that's what Scott said that Thomas said as he left the human world. So I've got my closing thoughts here. Then I'm going to read a poem from Taliesin to close. So yet, yeah, thinking of an overarching theme, which really came out at the top this morning. So again, thank you everybody from this morning, because I really believe in integrating the ideas of the audience. The nature initiative theory is largely about that the, these stories contain remnants of old teaching, the animal transformations, the magical transformations. They're not simply punishments, although some of the figures of the time may have seen it that way, but those metaphors were being used as teaching tools. Now, when I've talked about the Bardic schools before, some of the training of young people did happen in bardic schools and the way that they would have trained themselves was having the students build. Don't know if you've seen, um, oh yeah, The Last Jedi, that's when the name almost went, right? The Last Jedi, 
in the most recent Star Wars trilogy, where you've got this rain-washed island on a planet where Luke Skywalker is hiding out in little ancient stone cells. The, imagine though, those are, those cells were off on the, on the little island, way off the coast of Ireland into the ocean. And these are the type of cells that young students would be trained to both build and then lie down in on stone ground in the dark with the doors closed with great heavy stones on their chest. And again, I've talked about material effects because then they feel the material weight of life and the elements on their chest, on their hearts, the gravity of that. And they lie there until inspiration, until the fire in their head comes. And they've been taught all these stories and all these tales with teachings in them of the three worlds and an Anun. So Anun, Abred, Gwynvith, Kaigan. And lying there until their own fire ignites and inspiration moves within them and they create their own poetry. So this is, that's a powerful image of nature initiation. But skimming through the themes, we have then blood eye with. We have manipulation and dominion of women through the sort of misogynistic magicians, quite like the alliteration there, the horror of the transformations. But essentially, the, there's lots of memories of lost deities, and that's what's present for me in all of these stories. Whenever I tell them, whenever I read them, is not only thinking about the lost deities, but all the lost fragments and great and myths have lost so much. But also these characters largely just like with the cattle raids in Ireland, working through power over territory, seeking that. Taliesin, we've had the ableism, monstering, disability, the monstrous feminine, but also again, the teaching hidden in the wheel of the year the wheel of the year hidden in that story. And the Bard at Schools theory has been presented by Caitlin Matthews. It's not my theory, I received it from her. That in her translation of the Privy Anun, the spells of Anun, where Arthur rode his ship Pridwen, one of the old goddesses of Britain, and Pridwen being an old name for Britain, Britain. Um, her book, King Arthur's Raid on the Other World, is a great exploration of that, 2008. You'll find that in the bibliography, which I will share soon. And Thomas, you've got the psychological or cosmic horror, touching the unknowable vastness of nature, and also the reality of change and the wars and of death. And, you know, and perhaps in some way, some remnant in him of like, the old bard at schools, even though he was well after that period, but he took that on somehow. So yeah, places and story can be seen to be have a powerful effect on us, initiating great myths, nature initiation, and genius loci being a powerful tool upon this in creating each of these myths. I'm just gonna stick my computer down. And read from The Last Celtic Shaman by John Matthews. And this is Taliesin's song of his origins. Firstly, I was formed in the shape of a handsome man in the hall of Keridwin in order to be refined. Although small and modest in my behavior, I was great in her lofty sanctuary. While I was held prisoner, sweet inspiration educated me. Laws were imparted to me in a speech which had no words, but I had to flee from the angry, terrible hag whose outcry was terrifying. Since then I have fled in the shape of a crow, since then, I have fled as a speedy frog. Since then, I have fled with rage in my chains, a roll buck in a dense thicket. I have fled in the shape of a raven of prophetic speech, the shape of a satirizing fox 
the shape of a sure swift, the shape of a squirrel vainly hiding. I have fled in shape of a red deer, in the shape of iron in a fierce fire, the shape of a sword sowing death and disaster, the shape of a bull relentlessly struggling. I have fled in the shape of a bristling boar in a ravine, the shape of a grain of wheat. I have been taken by the talons of a bird of prey, which increased until it took the size of a foal. I have floated like a boat in its waters. I was thrown into a dark bag and onto an endless sea and set adrift. And just as I was suffocating, I had a happy omen and the master of heaven brought me to liberty. So I will then, now, there's my bibliography, page one. So if you want, you're welcome to screenshot that. I'll give you a moment. And then we have my second page. And you're welcome to screenshot this. And yeah, that's a lot of the sacred text archive and the survey of Scottish witchcraft. There you go. And then we have my details in case you need them again. You're welcome to contact me on Twitter. And thank you very much. I will stop sharing and we are done.